good to have you all back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Today is the 4th of November in 2020. Yesterday was election day and we're still counting votes, absentee votes like mine, for example, because I was allowed to vote from away and we're still crossing fingers. But um, DeSoto and I decided not to get deeper into that and not making this a, um, an election show. Uh, we decided to continue to lift our spirits up and look into potential best practices because in a while we have actually bigger problems to solve. The pandemic, which we still have, by the way, hit us harder than any other state and our unemployment rate is at 20%. So we desperately need uh, housing uh, for the many in need. And so today we want to dedicate the show again, looking at a practice from uh, half around the world that maybe we can learn something from. So uh, hi, DeSoto. Hello, Martin. Hello, everybody else. And you're in Germany and I'm in Honolulu. And I'm, I'm happy to hear your birds in the, in the yes, background you do. and see your dog. There's a doggy it's very, bag. It's very comforting. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> so um, let's go to the first page here. And uh, we want you, the audience, to think where have you been, or as you said, sort of correctly, have you been around at all back in this era that we share where we were at that time? And this is still, you know, picking up on having gotten political the last couple of shows where we said that really maybe the true, the last true, authentic, passionate, honest, integer era might have been the early 70s. And we said Steve Owl, who we miss, was certainly the best architectural embodiment of that. And the politician at that time was Jimmy Carter. So here again, we are just giving you examples of how we want you to think, where have you been at that time? And to sort of explain a little bit, the top part of the page here, where you have been back in 72. <laughs> well, I'm gonna be looking to the side because I'm looking at the picture to be able to describe it to you. This picture of me in 1972 in the upper left corner, and that's on Christmas day. And that's Christmas Day in Honolulu, not Christmas Day in Germany, where you cannot dress like that, as you just pointed out. Um, you also see me with my 1971 Volkswagen Beetle. And you also see my mother's 1967 Mercedes that her mother ordered from Germany. Uh, her mother never drove it because she passed away. But it went to her, grand her father, and then my grandfather gave it to my mother in 1972, and that's an important year. That's what we're going to be talking about. And then you also see the PIing mobile draw belonging to Martin Despang that is currently housed in the same stall at my parents' house that that 1967 Mercedes used to live in. And then the rest of that is the youthful Martin back in Germany. Yeah, and... Uh the light blue car just on top of uh, the RPIing mobile is from the year, the same year the project is from that we're going to talk about today, the same year 72. And that's my 72 Plymouth Fury, my Fury 2. But it took me until two decades later to be a student to uh, go to the United States, go to college there and afford this dream of my childhood, which cost me only $600. And the gallon of gas was 99 cents. So that was rather affordable. <laughs> and uh, uh, the picture on the right of that one is me next to my mother and my sister leaning to the car my parents had at that time. There was another Mercedes from that era. And that holds the model uh, number W114. Architecturally, uh, the pictures below, again, uh, what you are able to do on Christmas being in shorts and t-shirts, we were only able to do, and we only are able to do that for the very few months in the summer. But that's where you see down there, this beautiful uh, laid back 70s life on that outdoor living room. 
uh, lanai that my father so so neatly all self-designed and self-built himself and with my mother they were knitting these cushions there and these sofa pillars and that we're sitting on and you have all the pretty mothers lined up in a row i think that was at a birthday party of us kids so i have nothing but the best memories of of the 70s being uh, again, as we said before, pretty authentic and, and pretty uh, sensitive uh, times, um, maybe the last ones of that time that we need to reconnect back to. And that's what we want to talk about today. So next slide is um, while, you know, it looked rather idyllic and paradisal on our uh, sky and I on our roof terrace. Uh, a year before the project we're going to talk about today in 1971, my sleepy hometown of Hanover with uh, as many or as few people as we have in the urban core of Honolulu, which has half of a million, which is not much. They were thinking they got to come up with these megalomanic superstructure here, which was called the Eme, the Eme Center, the Eme Zentrum. And the Ima is a river that you see running at the bottom left picture running along. But um, that was then and now is now. And how did now come across to you, the Soro, which we see at the very bottom right? Well, I asked you about this and you said that this was a multi-use uh, large development. So it had living apart apartments for people to live in. It had office space and it also had retail space. And so the, the picture that you see where the uh, there's a sort of a central plaza that was for the public. And unfortunately, as you pointed out, it's hit very hard times. And this, as we saw in the United States, was a redevelopment of an economically depressed area. I believe that's what you agreed to. So it had its moment of glory in the 1970s, and then it has hit very hard times. And now it's either partly empty, or it's in ruins, or it's got graffiti on it. and. Uh, does not look very good. So its promise of the 70s has not been fulfilled in the 21st century. Absolutely. And the the original picture from when it was freshly completed, the top left, I, I have vague childhood memories, must have been a teen there. When it was freshly open, it actually worked and it had this very vibrant, you know, futuristic forward thinking, which again, at the very beginning of the 70s was when that was phasing out in the United States, ever since then, Reagan were reactionary and think the past was better than the future will ever be. And we're unfortunately talking, counting votes. We're continuously in that and so desperately want to get out of this. So what has really made this fail? There's also one clue. You see this like yellow or orangey shading behind the windows. 71, there was really little to no uh, consideration of what we have, we should care a lot about today, which is environmental concerns. There was no such thing in, in the early 70s. So a couple of things must have been coming together. And the gentleman you see hovering over the tower in the, in the background on that top left picture is the, uh, at that time, head of the city planning department, uh, Hans Adrian. And he basically said, well, the best way to not having to look at that project is to live in it. And I have, you know, a vague, again, childhood memories of my father being, uh, you know, lose friends with him and we've been visiting him and he took that privileged position literally and figuratively to, to dwell on the very top floor. So almost like the king in his castle and overlooking the little people down there that didn't appreciate it as much as, he didn't even. So yeah, it is. I mean, the picture from the bottom right is pretty contemporary and it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty desolate situation condition. We threw in these two uh, uh, show quotations at the top left, uh, the central plaza of the Pacific, certainly being our most prominent piece of brutalism in downtown. And then in the last show, we found out about uh, Steve Au's Hiko building. Um, on Ward Avenue that is still there. But uh, both of them are basically um, uh, commercial and, and office typologies and not dwelling. And so um, even in Hawaii, while tropical brutalism, you know, as we continue to investigate has been quite um, interesting and, and forward thinking, 
it hasn't been applied, at least not in a large extent to housing. And that's what we actually will look into because housing, affordable housing is what we need these days more than ever. So let's look at the next slide and um, what are we talking about here, DeSoto? We're talking about the Olympics in Munich, the city of Munich in 1972. And the picture that you took from your car, from your mm -hmm. sticking your hand through the sunroof, shows us the site of the Olympics. And on the left side is the, this really strange, interesting structure, which you said is still standing and in good condition, which was built for some of the sporting events. And it looks like sort of a big piece of fabric that's hanging from these large uh, poles that's suspended. But it yeah. actually isn't fabric, you said. It's actually um, acrylic, acrylic or plastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's also a picture of the the automobile, which you still own, which is sitting in the garage below me right at this minute, um, which also dates from that same time period, that the particular model of the Mercedes. Yeah. And the way, and this is a quote from a Mercedes-Benz website where they call this their car, which they made from, as it says, from 71 till... 89 ours is one of the last ones from 87 so two decades they left that model unchanged and that's why they called it innovative evergreen and that's how you can certainly call this architecture which many including me consider to be if not the finest piece of architecture in germany and it's 40 years i should say young because it just looks as fresh as it has always been it's we always 50. want it's almost 50 hmm? now Oh yeah, almost 50, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. 70s turning 50 is the slogan, right. the Dokomomo slogan, right. thank you, yeah, right. exactly. And we also see something that I have a childhood memory of, which is that little uh, mascot there, <laughs> whose name was Waldi, and Waldi is that sausage dog, very German, and he's been sliced into these different parts and, and they're, they're color coded, and we get to that color coding in a little bit. Yes. But we're not going to talk about the, uh, the, the sports center because, again, we're not short on that. There's going to be the arena, and who knows when they're going to replace that. But that's another subject in Honolulu I'm talking. But yes. housing, housing, housing is the most precious. And so we're going to go to the next slide and look at what was the, um, pretty much the housing part of that. Uh, we can't get around, uh, you know, yesterday we had a tragic um, um, terrorist attack in Austria, right, um, of Islamic nature, we can carefully say. And that's unfortunately also what happened in um, differently, but somehow uh, similar back in 72, where it had been, this project had been the stage for this, what they call, what we remember as the Munich massacre where the Palestinians were taking uh, Israeli um, uh, uh, sports members of their, of their team hostage and killed them. And that, that's, that was a bummer and obviously very sad as an opening for games that by the architects Fry Otto and Günther Benisch was intentionally basically crafted to um, be about as we were talking, the vibe of the early 70s about happiness and, and a hopeful future. So bad start on that one, but uh, next slide. Um, somehow magically, I guess we, we can say, or for good reasons, as we will try to find out, this project has not failed, has not become, not, does not share the destiny with a tragic Hanover project and many others of that era of megalomanic, uh, you know, building housing on steroids that you don't give the time as uh, you gave European cities that have a chance to grow over thousands of years and always adjust to changing needs. He need to pop it up from scratch instantly, right? And by the way, the number of units in what we're talking about is 5,000, 5,000 people. So um, what are we looking here? What surprised you? Well, you pointed out these are pictures you took again when you were driving to this this Olympic Village area, and you said that in one view from this large boulevard, which is a divided uh, street with three lanes on either side, you do get a, a some some view of uh, urban area of a high-rise building, for example, which you pointed out is a hotel. 
but you also see what looks like just a heavily vegetated area of just trees. And Jungle. to my surprise, that uh, this actually is a berm. It's an earthen berm that's been planted. And if you approach these, this complex from that side, if you walk in from the street level, you will walk across the berm and uh, on a concrete, a raised elevated concrete pathway. So that's what the lower picture shows. And as you said, most people don't approach it from that side, but if you do, it doesn't look like there's anything there. It looks like it's just a forest. Yeah. But look, let's look at how it looks like from where you usually approach it, which gets us to the next slide. And you did some research on that funky looking vehicle, right? Well, you pointed out this is a very meaningful vehicle to you, and I'll let you tell the family history about that. But that's a Citroën, and it is, uh, and some people in the United States, some called it by its French name, which is a deux chevaux, two horse. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it was a very low cost car. It was built from the 1940s up into the 1990s. Um, it was sort of the, the common person's vehicle in France. It was, um, you know, very low cost, very tinny, very, you know, basic. But that's what's leading us into the important part of this complex, which we are about to enter, which is underneath. But you tell the story of why that's important to you personally. Well, without that car, I wouldn't be because uh, my father, when he was an architectural student, had one and then he was heading to Italy and it broke down in Austria when he was driving through and he needed to get a job to get it fixed. And while he was there, it was winter season. He said, I might as well hit the ski slopes. And he did. And this is where he picked up my mom who is an Austrian farm girl. So the rest is history. And then it must have been his car. His car was so yeah, romantic that she, was, exactly. she fell for him. Yeah, Just like an American graffiti, as you were sending yes, me. That's right. You know, that's right. Before the show. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> and if, right. if you want to see one in Honolulu, there's two that I know of. One is close to, here, to our hood at the foothills of Diamond Head. Yeah, uh, there's a red one red, that someone that's reported from um, the Netherlands, I think, recently. But there's a, one of the early ones, which was had we were talking corrugation with the, the yes. thing, the VW 181. Yes, the early De Chavos had that as well. The hood was basically corrugated, and there is one on Alawai. It always parked along the parking on Alawai Boulevard, pretty much towards the uh, Waikiki Harbor. So if you want to check out one in real in Honolulu. That's right. Check out these two. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah, that car happened to be there, family history. And again, as you said, when we're proud of our uh, SL that was made unchanged for two decades, this was made for half of a century, for 50 years, from the 40s to the 90s. So they're very rare. So I was lucky. I thought this is this a sign. So I follow that one. So <laughs> let's see where it took us, uh, where it took me. So let's go to the next slide. And although we see um, uh, finest American post-fossil mobility there in a Tesla being charged, but you can see our little uh, European PI mobile, our French Twingo, which you can see in many ways as being the successor of the uh, De Chevaux. You also see a smart car down there. It's pretty much the ground floor is all parking. And we were comparing it to the Alamoana Mall in some ways of the parking, which we will get to in I think the next slide. But the difference is when I was recently before I flew back, um, um, I was visiting uh, Alexei in his place in 1315 Alamoana Boulevard. And I thought my smart idea would be to park in the mall and we had too good of time so i got out late from his place and my car was gone and towed to some remote place on sand island and cost me 200 dollars or whatever that doesn't seem to be the case here we we're saying because that bmw behind me uh, seems to have so much dust on his windshield that it's hard to drive with that right so they're pretty liberal in allowing you to keep your cars there. Go to the next slide, which shows us how you get up to the main floor, uh, which is the elevated floor, and you get up through very, uh, a variety of different 
very artistically sculptured staircases or at the top right, the staircase tower that gets you up to your unit. And let's go to the next slide. And this is the heart of the community. This is the center. And um, how did you like that, DeSoto, when you saw that and we discussed it? Well, we, we talked about various things. In the first place, in the upper left corner, there are these pylons, these slabs. Actually, you know what they look like? They look like the slab in the movie 2001. Oh, that's it right. came out in 1968. Yeah. And yeah. This, these slabs are, are, were at the time very modern. They had digital clocks in them that you could see what the times were throughout the world, et cetera. Now that's not as cool because of course we all have a smartphone that can do the same thing. But it's also, this complex has got these weird, large overhead pipes that really puzzled me when I first saw them. And they're painted different colors and they're, they're on supports and they run through the public areas. Now, one of them that's, that we see in the lower left corner has a decorative function of, it turns into a fountain. So there's water coming out of it that makes kind of a curtain. And we also see that there is a similarity to what used to be at the center of Ala Moana Center, which was this decorative pool that had a kind of a pylon in the center of it with a tiled mosaic, one different one on each side. Uh, unfortunately, that was destroyed way back about 1990 or even in the late 80s when Ala Moana got remodeled and we wish that hadn't happened, but it did. But those pipes, the colored pipes really don't carry anything. They don't have a function as much as they are first a way to find your way through the complex. You can follow that elevated pipe according to a certain color. Sometimes there are, is function to them. There's lighting, as you said, and there may be wires in them, but they're more, they're not as utilitarian as that, although they look that way. They have other functions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, again, as part of us as Docomomo supporters or board members, in my case, again, when we have things that are unique, they're keepers. So again, we really miss that original condition of the mall. And we're really happy to see that have been conserved and kept over half of a century in, in this project here. So let's go to the next slide and check it out even more. So this is uh, pretty much a picture I took of the two significantly different parts of, um, of, the, of the housing development. One is a rather more generic kind of um, stack, more conventionally stacked tower that you see on the right side where um, you have a rectangle and you just extrude that to the top. But uh, the left one is what mostly the, the, the community is comprised of which are these uh, terraced houses. And you see the side plan up there at the top right, you see the north arrow. So most of the units, um, and this is a key to success, is orientation, orientation, orientation. They're facing predominantly south. Some of them have a, a tilt towards west or east, but they're all facing south. And that is, uh, that is what they are uh, as they are laid out. And that's really strategically laid out that way. Next slide. Yeah, uh, what was your feelings about this, what you see here on the main pedestrian walkways? Well, again, hearkening back to Waldy the mascot who had different colors on him, you do see that this color sort of coating is also extended through this entire complex. And I noticed in some of the pictures, the bricks on the ground are different colors as well as the overhead pipes. There's also these uh, water features. And I looked at the water features in the two lower photographs and said, oh, they, they're not functioning anymore. And you pointed out that no, during the winter, they don't have water in them, but during the summer, they do have water and, and they are functioning. So I was yeah. wrong. Um, but again, I, I don't know what it's like in temperate climates. I don't have to think about that. Um, well, I was, there, I was there at the first lockdown, around the first lockdown in, in early spring, and they hadn't activated them yet. Yeah. Okay, okay. But there's also a photograph in the upper right of people who look like they're around a swimming pool, but there maybe isn't a pool there. We're not quite sure. They're in their bathing attire. There is a uh, shower there, but regardless of what they're doing, they are enjoying themselves, and they are using that for recreation, whether they're, whether they're able to swim there or not. They look like they were. 
least they're relaxing. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're just in the sun because mm-hmm. you like to be in the sun where it's cold and it's gray a lot of times. Exactly. But I think that picture is perfect for depicting the 70s in this very sort of free and enjoying and and just, you know, living it up kind of mentality that we wish we would have still and we should reconnect to. So next slide. Um, they're, they're still doing, uh, they're taking care of it, which is also something if you have a really good building, you know, buildings age, so you got to take care of it. And they do here. I, uh, I, you know, I was witnessing that situation. And the next slide, we're getting towards the end of the show. We have two minutes left, but we will stop here soon and then pick up from there next week. But this is pretty much how uh, the, the kind of the pedestrian streets look like. Uh, on the left side is how the terrace houses look on the north side. And you got the kitchen there and you got a little table there where you can have breakfast, lunch and dinner. All very pleasant. Doesn't look very urban, right? Doesn't look like right. in the same city. That looks like suburbia. So they were very right. successful in bringing the quality of suburbia that supposedly everyone wants right. into the urban core, right? So I think with that, um, I think this sort of we might um, leave it there and, and pick up uh, from, from here. Maybe yeah. we do one more picture here. Let's see okay. what that represents okay. here as the closing note kind of picture. Okay. Let's, uh, get us one more. Yeah, this one we have to talk more about because it's rather uh, strange, look kind of strange to you because it's uh, at the bottom, at the, at the most southern end of the high rises is basically a very low rise but very dense community and that one has some some funky and funny background that we will then see you for next week to tell you more (laughs) about it (laughs) all right well see you next week for that okay until then keep counting votes and crossing fingers okay aloha everybody (laughs)